Hi folks, I hope all is going well. So similar to before, I'd like to talk about a couple of specific topics related to alcohol. For example, what different types of alcohol are there? How do you calculate the blood alcohol level of somebody, especially when time passes? And I'll also give you a little bit of a background on what beer is, what types of beer are out there, and then have a conversation about uh, alcohol and driving impairment. So you're going to notice that there's a lot of PowerPoint uh, slides here. I'm not going to go through all of them in depth because the book and the Connect chapters really did a good job with that, but I will give you a brief overview. So just keep in mind that alcohol means something different in science than it does in uh, everyday vernacular. So typically when somebody on the street will say alcohol, they're referring to ethanol or ethyl alcohol. That is the potent potable. It is the type of alcohol we drink. But there are different types of alcohol out there as well. One is methanol or methyl alcohol. Uh, this is typically called wood alcohol. This is the very dangerous type that you get from, for example, products such as uh, moonshine. And that's because it contains methanol so along with a little bit of ethanol. And that methanol in the body gets converted to a different chemical called formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is very dangerous for the body when it's uh, consumed in high amounts. Um, it can cause blindness and death. Uh, it makes It's not potable. You can't drink it. There's also, also isopropanol or isopropyl alcohol. That's rubbing alcohol. That's the alcohol that we use on cuts. Again, we can't drink that or consume that. So the only uh, alcohol that we can consume is ethanol or ethyl alcohol. Uh, the other ones can have serious health consequences and we need to steer clear of them. So what is ethanol? There's a lot of information that we can find on our uh, chapter on this. Uh, one of the biggest things is it's the most commonly used drug, especially in the United States, provides calorie content, so it's seven kilocalories or seven calories per gram. Uh, it's a nutritive source, but provides a little more than calories, so we don't consider it to be something that someone would take to try to even get calories or because they're concerned about different nutritional values. 3% uh, of total calories in the North, uh, typical North American diet come from alcohol, and the big numbers are down here. 14 million Americans suffer from alcoholism, and around 32 million Americans engage in binge drinking on uh, routine occurrences, for example, Friday night, et cetera, something such as that. On the right here, we see a table that breaks down how much uh, quantity we'd find for the different types of beverages that contain alcohol and how large those quantities are for a standard drink. Uh, what's going to happen is no matter which one you take, it's going to have about the same amount of alcohol within it. So basically, any standard drink of these will raise the blood alcohol level by 0 0.02. Uh, now, something to keep in mind, though, is, and this is the big thing. If we try to do uh, alcohol counting or beer counting, for example, in a bar, uh, it can be very, very dangerous or difficult to do so. And that's because bars typically serve more alcohol than is in a standard shot or a standard drink. So again, thinking back, a regular beer is 12 fluid ounces. But if you go to a bar and you grab, uh, for example, a pint of something, it's usually between 16 to 20 ounces. Even with shots, if they're not using a jig row to measure out the exact amount of one ounce, uh, you're going to find out that there's much more inside of that shot then, uh, or the mixed cocktail than just uh, maybe one to 1 1.5 ounces. It could be two, three ounces or more. So again, um, trying to count how much blood alcohol level is rising as a result of how many drinks you've had in a bar uh, can actually be uh, difficult to do and could be, uh, it, it could be inaccurate. And that could obviously have an impact, especially if you want to drive later. Here you go, just a nice little diagram that shows you how much we find. So basically breaking it down again, you have a beer, a can of beer is about the same as uh, eight to nine fluid ounces of malt liquor. And you can see in a 12 ounce glass, because malt liquor is a higher amount of alcohol, and keep in mind the percentage of alcohol is always going to play a role in, in how much alcohol is actually consumed. Table wine, and even, uh, you know, for example, uh, a liquor like a, a whiskey or a shot of something, and we can see how much quantity changes there because the alcohol per volume or the percent changes between these drinks. So I do want to help you out as far as calculating the blood alcohol level. This is how we're going to find out how much of our blood or what percent of our blood has now has alcohol in it. So uh, what we know and what we saw in the last couple of slides when your book talks about a little bit, but we're going to practice is to calculate how to get that BA level. So imagine that each standard drink raises the BAL in a person by 0 0.02. And keep in mind the liver processes on average one drink per hour. Okay, So this is going to be a little bit different depending upon who you are. Males versus females process uh, alcohol a little bit differently. Uh, the overall mass of the person, how much uh, muscle mass they have versus fat, all these things are going to quantitate into how quickly your body is able to absorb and process alcohol. We'll talk about this a little bit. Your book also does a good job with it. 
But here's the scenario. Imagine we have a friend, their name is Kevin. Kevin drinks five beers at 8 p.m. And it's just like he just drank them like that. Okay, so, they, so we're imagining if they were all consumed within a minute, for example. Well, then we can calculate his BAL. In this case, we're going to say, again, that each drink raises his BAL by 0 0.02. He had five drinks, so it's times five. So his BAL would be 0.1 at this point, all right? So it's a simple math calculation. You can use a calculator for it um, that, to gain confidence there. Uh, obviously, with that, he's over the legal limit to drive. Now, imagine two hours passes. now 10 p.m. since he consumed these drinks. So keep in mind, if it's been two hours, his BAL should have dropped about 0.4%. Uh, That's because every hour your, your liver is processing out 0.02%. So two hours means 0.04%. So now his BAL is 0.06 or 0.06%. Now by that, so that's, again, this is the crude uh, you know, calculation based off of just assuming it was a standard drink, assuming he's, he's processing 0.02% alcohol per hour. Uh, that means he's got a BAL of 0 0.06. He is still buzzed. In many states, he's over the legal limit, and he should not drive. Just based on the, the numbers alone, not also based on the idea, again, and what we're going to talk about is no matter how much alcohol is in the body, uh, it's a good time not to drive. Even one drink can impact ability on the road. Okay, so now's an ex opportunity for you to have a little bit of exercise yourself on this. Imagine we have another friend, Cynthia, and she's going to attend a party. At 9 p.m., she drinks four standard glasses of wine. This is the same idea. Basically, at 9 p.m., exactly four standard glasses of wine, she consumes them. It is now 11 p.m. What is her blood alcohol level? Okay, so first you got to calculate out what her BAL would be at 9 p.m., then take into account the two hours that have passed, and then tell me what her BAL is. So take a few seconds, pause the video, work out the math, and then on the next slide, I'll show you the answer. Okay, are you back with me? Because I'm going to turn on to the next slide now. Here we go. So here is the answer. So she had four standard drinks at 9 p.m. So each one is going to raise her BAL 0 0.02. So 0 0.02 times 4, 0 0.08. So at 9 p.m., her BAL was 0.08%. So then two hours pass, and we're going to assume that she's processing one uh, drink an hour, so 0.02% per hour. So she should have dropped about 0 0.04. So if she started with 0 0.08, and then 0.04 is taken away because two hours has passed. Her BAL now should be 0.04%. So most states will say that she's at the legal limit to drive, but at the same point, she's probably still buzzed. And remember, buzz driving is considered drunk driving. She shouldn't be behind the wheel. So this goes back to that general idea. Ideally, people should drive with no alcohol in their system. Even one beer is too much. If you have a drink with or a glass of wine with dinner, then the entire meal passes. It's probably been about an hour. Your BAL should be back down to zero. That's that's considered okay. But what we're learning more and more by the data is that any alcohol in a person's system impedes their ability to make correct decisions behind the wheel. It impacts their uh, response rate. Um, more aggressive behavior comes out with any alcohol. This is with just one at one drink. Okay, so really, ideally, even though we've done the BAL to calculate how it would work out, no alcohol should be in somebody's system when they drive. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this in a few slides. I do want to take a few minutes, though, to talk about um, different alcohol products that you can find in the area. And, you know, one of the things that we have to keep in mind, the same as the rest of the book and the chapters that we've been talking about, we talked a lot about consumerism and different, different different types of products. Something to keep in mind is that beer and alcohol are also consumer products, and they become multi-million dollar industries. So take, for example, Budweiser. Budweiser became Budweiser Anheuser-Busch, which is now InBev. It's called AB InBev. It's a Belgian-Brazilian publicly traded company. So again, this isn't really an American product anymore, even though it's made in America. It's owned by an international company. Uh, AB InBev owns over 200 brands. I'm going to show you some of these on the next slide. At the same time, we have major industries such as Budweiser and Anheuser-Busch. We do have some very nice local craft beers in the area. Uh, one is called Yingling. Yingling is the oldest brewery in America. It's family-owned. It's brewed down in Pennsylvania. Captain, Lauren Brewer, uh, Captain Lawrence Brewing Company is, is made right here in Westchester County. And even Doc's Draft Hard Cider is made about an hour away, a little bit north of here in Warwick, because that's a big cider uh, part of the country, and they have lots of apple orchards up there as well. So the reason I'm really bringing this up to you again, and I'm going to show you a couple more slides on this whole idea, is the same as everything else. You know, uh, one of the main, main things that tend to take away from the class is, you know, you're a consumer, but you should become an informed consumer. Where do you want your products to come from? Uh, one of the things that we talk about at times is, you know, thinking back to the introductory uh, uh, video lecture. Uh, you know, we talk about all the 
uh, major recalls that have happened over the last few years. Well, that all happens from major industry. You know, the big romaine lettuce recall is happening because of romaine lettuce that was grown in California and Arizona. If romaine lettuce is grown locally by a local farmer in your backyard, it's not going to have the risk of E. coli contamination. So the same thing sort of falls in place with uh, craft beer and different alcohol products. You can talk to the person making the product. You can ask them who they're associated with, what went into the product. Um, you know, and in addition to all that other information, also if you buy local beer, you're using local water supply. So it goes back to the idea as far as changing water tables that we talked about in a module ago. So again, all these sort of things that take, take into account, staying local, uh, talking to people that actually make the products that you're consuming, it can help with your ecological or carbon footprint and also make sure that water stays where it should and making sure you're informed as a consumer as far as what you're consuming. Here's just an idea because a lot of people sometimes ask me, uh, you know, what's the difference between, uh, you know, ales and lagers and all these different types of beers. So I'm going to show you a couple of diagrams on this. Ales, uh, you know, really comes down to the yeast, where the yeast sits uh, in the brewing process. With ales, yeast sits on the top uh, during fermentation and the whole fermentation process is warm. Whereas with lagers, it's a cold fermentation process. You can see it's cooler and the yeast sits on the bottom of the fermenter. So we can see with the warm, we have our pal owls, our porters, our stouts, et cetera. With the lagers, it's more cold, pilsners, box, Oktoberfest, this is what we're gonna find on this side. Uh, now, you know, something to keep in mind with this, what that means also is lagers have to be consumed extremely cold. So a lot of times when we think about certain products like Budweiser uh, or even, uh, you know, um, uh, Coors Light, those are all lagers, all right? So we find lagers in American Pilsner. That's why they have to be kept extremely cold to be consumed because if they warm up, it doesn't give a good taste. Whereas the ales, since they were brewed at a warmer temperature, they can be consumed at a warmer temperature and they still taste good. So that's one of the reasons why between these two products, you know, if you, if you drink a Budweiser and it's out on the tabletop for an hour, it doesn't taste good anymore. As, whereas an ale, you could leave it out for a while and it's still quite uh, enjoyable. Here's some more information for you on that, so you can review this at any time you want to look at the differences between the lagers and the ales. And this is just to show you as far as, you know, think back, maybe take a second before you look at this, think of maybe five or six different uh, types of beer you know about, and then see if it's owned by AB InBev or even SAB Miller, because Miller is also a huge, huge company with a lot of uh, names under its label. We see Miller is Miller, but look, it's also Foster, Peroni, uh, Ice House, Milwaukee's Best, all the same company okay so again the question is is you know they can sometimes operate independently but sometimes also they fall as far as what the company wants them to do one of the classic examples of this is ab InBev. so you see budweiser stella artois bush elysian all underneath the same family name um labat blue so canadian beers uh this one down here rolling rock is a really good example of this Rolling Rock used to be made in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, but when AB InBev bought them, they moved the plant from Latrobe, Pennsylvania to somewhere in New Jersey. Uh, it really hurt the economy in Latrobe, but even more so, the reason that Rolling Rock was always considered to be a, a, an elite beer or a delectable beer was because the fermenters were glass-lined. Um, that's what Rolling Rock got its name from originally. Uh, the thing is, when they moved to the fermenters in New Jersey, they don't use glass-lined fermenters anymore. So the entire reason... Uh, Rolling Rock used to be a popular drink, is lost, and it's, it happened after they became part of the AB InBev label. Keep in mind also, since I brought it up, I wanted to talk about cider for one second. Uh, you know, before we consumed beer uh, in America, we consumed cider. Cider was one of the first things, thinking back to the whole Johnny Appleseed movement. Uh, you know, the country really worked really hard to get a lot of apple orchards working, and with apple orchards came apple cider, and hard ciders as well with that. And so there's a big movement now to go back to the roots. So that's why we see a lot of cider products on the market again today. How is alcohol made? It's really made by an anaerobic process, which is called fermentation. We can see that again, going back to what we learned in chapter four, carbohydrates taken in, typically maltose, which is that diglucose molecule, fermented over made, eth made into ethanol. So that's if there's no oxygen allowed in the process. If you do allow oxygen in the process, that's when vinegar forms. So sometimes you might open up, for example, a bottle of wine or uh, another, you know, product. And if it, if it smells or tastes vinegary, what happened is during the fermentation process, oxygen got in there. So instead of the yeast being able to turn it to anaerobic or a non-oxygen environment into ethanol, the oxygen present turned it into vinegar instead. That's what sometimes occurs. 
as far as alcohol absorption, uh, there's different rates as far as how it's absorbed in the body. Um, also between male and female, uh, males can absorb a little bit more uh, than females, and it, it leads to uh, higher levels of BAL typically in females, slightly higher. Um, there are some different ways that people have tried to absorb alcohol in the past, and I would not recommend anything besides uh, the way that alcohol is supposed to be consumed, which is uh, through the mouth. Um, there was a time a few years ago, and you know these things come and go, but people were trying to take shots through the eye. So they would take, for example, vodka and apply it directly to the eye, thinking, oh, it's a mucosal membrane. Uh, you know, the alcohol can pass through. Uh, yes, that is somewhat true, but at the same time, it can cause severe eye damage. So obviously, it can hurt. Uh, the, the outer layer of the eye um, and can lead to vision loss. So it's, it's not a good idea. At the end of the day, again, alcohol speed is consumed in a certain way and that's orally. This information is in your textbook. So I just want you to, again, take some time and look at how alcohol is metabolized by the body. We see a lot of it is in the liver, but again, gender, race, size, food, physical condition, all these things, alcohol content, it's all going to come into play as far as how quickly that alcohol is metabolized. It plays back to the idea as far as when you try to calculate a BAL, you have to be very, very careful because, again, um, depending upon metabolism, it's going to change the, the BAL down the road as far as two, three hours later, what's the actual BAL of the person. Um, one of these things that does play into this, and this happens with certain people in certain populations, uh, when we take alcohol and we metabolize it, uh, you know, we take it in as alcohol, but there's two enzymes here, and, and enzymes are going to break down the alcohol for us and eventually turn into carbon dioxide and water. Uh, the first one is alcohol dehydrogenase. Alcohol dehydrogenase converts alcohol into another uh, carbohydrate called acetaldehyde. Now, once acetaldehyde is made, typically acetaldehyde dehydrogenase takes this and then converts it into carbon dioxide and water, and then, you know, water is excreted as urine out of the body. Um, but in certain populations, uh, acetaldehyde dehydrogenase is not highly active, and as a result, acetaldehyde can build up in the body um, when alcohol is consumed. This condition is typically called alcohol flush. And alcohol flush is because alcohol is converting to acetaldehyde, but then acetaldehyde gets to higher poisonous levels in the body. Keep in mind, alcohol itself is a poison, and all your body is really trying to do is get rid of the poison. So when acetaldehyde gets to high levels, alcohol flush uh, kicks in. This condition causes flushing or reddening, usually of the cheeks. It can cause a ringing in the ears uh, and just general disturbances of the person. Um, they don't feel very well. And typically, people that have alcohol flush or, um, you know, experience it typically stay away from alcohol. There are some benefits of moderate alcohol, moderate alcohol consumption that your book talks about. But, you know, the risks really outweigh the benefits. As we see here, um, you know, moderate use, we see no benefit, no benefit, no benefit. And the real risk is, is alcohol abuse. So it goes back to the general idea. Yes, there are a couple things that alcohol can help with, especially with certain, um, you know, HDL versus LDL levels. But the overall benefit of consuming alcohol or the risk of consuming alcohol outweighs any benefits it gives you. And the benefits it gives you is only if you consume maybe one to two drinks per day, any more than that, and you lose all the, the effects. One of these types of risks could be a condition called Korsakoff syndrome. Korsakoff syndrome is a result of, uh, you know, especially with alcoholism, uh, leads to a type of uh, brain disorder, usually associated with heavy alcohol consumption over a long period of time. And by heavy, typically you mean two to three drinks per day, um, because again, alcohol is not recommended to have every single day. It's really a result of a lack of thymine or vitamin B1 within the, uh, the individual. Um, typically, it's because heavy drinkers have poor eating habits. So it's just one of these things, again, that takes home this idea. There's a lot of risks associated with, uh, you know, alcohol uh, consumption. and They really outweigh any of the benefits. So, again, it's okay to consume alcohol occasionally. Um, it's not okay to consume alcohol with the idea it's going to be a benefit um, for cardiovascular disease, et cetera. That's what we consider to be not um, healthy thinking. Here's what we know about alcohol abuse. Uh, contributes to five of the leading causes of death. Uh, there are many different reasons here. We can see heart failure, certain cancers, cirrhosis of the liver, but motor vehicle accidents and suicides are also very, very high on those lists. So we can see that um, because of alcohol abuse, $185 billion is spent annually in the U.S. because of lost productivity, premature deaths, uh, direct treatment expenses, legal fees. Look at the cost of a, li a liver transplant in 2017. The average cost is over half a million dollars. So alcohol, even though uh, as a society we are tolerant of it, um, it's actually very dangerous, and it costs us a lot of money, um, and it's one of those things we have to keep in mind with alcohol. 
There's risk of breast cancer with alcohol consumption um, that occurs in men. It's another one of these risk factors. Uh, we see the same thing with women. Uh, you know, down here as far as when compared with teetotalers, so see these values, and you can see that the risk uh, increases for both men and women. Of course, liver cirrhosis is a major concern. On the left here, we can see a healthy liver. This is what a cirrhotic liver looks like. Okay, so again, you know, it's a, it's a real take-home message as far as, uh, you know, what happens with the individual. Look at when cirrhosis occurs, 50% chance of death within four years. It's one of these things that uh, when we think about all these risks, and it's something we think a lot about in the safety industry as well. Um, a lot of people say, think to themselves that, uh, you know, consume alcohol or do uh, risky activities. Uh, they think to themselves, well, it's only impacting me. Um, it's only my life, you know, it's not a big deal. Uh, keep in mind any sort of disease or any sort of thing that uh, causes uh, damage to the health of, of a person that we love impacts the family as well. So it's one of those things that sometimes helps people to keep things in perspective. Um, when somebody undergoes a liver failure, uh, when somebody's in a major car accident, um, and if these things happen because of the alcohol use, it, it impacts an entire family. It impacts the people that have to take care of that person. It impacts uh, the amount of money available to the family. Um, it impacts any children that might see that as it occurs. Uh, so, you know, it's always important to keep in mind with diseases such as uh, alcohol um, abuse or alcoholism that it's, it's actually a big picture thing where it's, it's a whole community and family um, issue that be becomes impacted there. Here's some numbers from the CDC. So we're going to take a few minutes and just talk about uh, alcohol and uh, car-related activities and the, uh, the danger here. Now think about this. this. This information is coming from the CDC. CDC is Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and they consider motor vehicle accidents as a result of alcohol-impaired driving to be a serious disease within the country. And we can see here, 112 million times a year, alcohol-impaired drivers put you at risk. Uh, you know, one in three crashes uh, deaths resulting in nearly 11,000 deaths in 2009. Look at these numbers here. Over, every day, around 30 people in the United States die in motor vehicle crashes that involve an alcohol-impaired driver. That's one death every 48 minutes. Um, cost, over $51 billion. Look at all the people that we lose um, because of alcohol-impaired driving crashes and how many people have been arrested because they're under the influence of alcohol or narcotics. It's an epidemic. Um, it's considered an epidemic in this country, what's happening with uh, alcohol use and driving. And it's something that we need to discuss. Um, one way that we've been discussing it as a society is trying to t uh, pull into the idea as far as uh, making people have consequences for when they decide to drive while drunk or impaired. And uh, one of these things is called a DWI or a DUI. So DWI is driving while intoxicated. DUI is just driving under the impairment. So DUI is, is a term that it can be lower than the DWI, which is 0 0.08. A lot of states have set a DUI around a 0 0.06 to a 0 0.05 now. And, uh, you know, it carries a hefty fine. So we can see in New York State, the estimated cost is around $10,000. But, you know, it's because not just because of the uh, fines, the fines are lower, but because also there's attorney fees, there's an insurance pool surcharge, additional insurance costs, to get a license back. All these things add a lot of cost to the individual. So here's uh, one thing that you could consider. So DWI in New York can cost the typical person between $10,000 to $30,000. Hopefully that's a deterrent uh, for most people or all people who decide to drive while intoxicated. But at the same time, thinking back to that BAL, uh, one would hope that somebody decides not to get behind the wheel if they've consumed alcohol. But let's say the person isn't sure. Let's say the person had two drinks at 9 o'clock, now it's 11 o'clock, and they just want to make sure they're okay to drive. Uh, this is something where a breathalyzer can really come in handy. So there's something called the Alcoholic Pro. This is the exact same breathalyzer that uh, police officers in New York State typically use when they pull somebody over. The first breathalyzer before they take somebody down to the station. They're very cheap, extremely affordable. It's about $100. And it's a good way to, you know, if this was kept in a car, to check in. It really takes the individual out of the perspective. No longer is an individual saying, hmm, am I okay to drive or am I not okay to drive? You're letting, uh, you know, that's really subjective. But now you're being objective. You're letting the machine tell you, nope, you're over the legal limit, or nope, look at you've still got a 0 0.03. That means you may be buzzed. Maybe it's not a good idea to get behind the wheel because you're under the influence of alcohol. So it's a nice system, um, and it's one that you know might some people might find useful to know about. Here's something most people don't recognize. You know, uh, driving while drunk has become a major stigma in America, which is a very very good thing. But one thing that we haven't uh, really developed a stigma about yet 
but is beginning to develop this thing about is texting or using a cell phone uh, when behind the wheel. What we're finding is that uh, a lot of data is coming out lately in comparison to the cell phone driver and the truck driver. And if you look at the date here, this is before texting even became available really to a lot of people. Here's the, here's, here's the conclusions of the study. They basically took people, they gave them alcohol or they gave them a cell phone and then looked at the reaction time under a simulation where they're behind the wheel of a car. Here was the conclusion. When driving conditions and time and task were controlled for, the impairments associated with using a cell phone while driving can be as profound as those associated with driving while drunk. That should be shocking. That should basically tell people, again, using a cell phone when in a car is similar in reaction time to driving while drunk. And if we think about it in those sort of terms, hopefully one can come to the conclusion, no cell phone should be used behind the wheel. Uh, cell phones are to be turned off or maybe put in the back seat because, again, it gives the reaction time and awareness to the individual uh, that of a drunk driver. So if we have a stigma about drunk driving, perhaps society, as we keep on moving forward, we're going to have an even stronger stigma against texting while driving or using a cell phone while driving. Alcohol also impairs greatly uh, fetal development, especially during the first trimester. You can see this is a chapter in your book that deals more with uh, development of the embryo. And we can see here during embryonic development, that first trimester is extremely important for development of the central nervous system. And it's during this period that any sort of, uh, you know, toxins, et cetera, can really impact, uh, you know, structural development and growth of these different centers. So you can see major structural abnormalities, central nervous system, the heart, all these things, they get really impacted by taking in any sort of toxin during that time. And one of those toxins can be alcohol. And that's again, why we always recommend, uh, you know, there should be zero alcohol consumption by a female uh, while she is uh, pregnant. We can see that this is different than when the zygote, so, you know, from the moment of conception, Till about the beginning of the first trimester, which is like week two or three after conception has occurred, we can see risk of the zygote is actually very, very low. But then during that first trimester, risk is very, very high, but continues on, especially with CNS throughout fetal development until the birth of the child. Um, if alcohol is consumed, it can lead to something called fetal alcohol syndrome. Your book goes over this, uh, this condition. And so I'll leave you to that. You can read in the book and, and what it can cause. And again, the take home is that's what we try to, you know, train and educate um, against alcohol use during pregnancy. Your book does do a good job as well talking about alcohol dependence, which is the gain of alcoholism. Um, so I'll leave that for the book to talk to you about. And, uh, you know, really the diagnosis of alcohol dependence and how that happens and, and all the different things. You can read this on your own. Um, but I do want to let you know there's, there's a very interesting book uh, that talks about alcohol dependence. It's a fiction book, and it's about one person's life um, leaving Las Vegas. It was written by a guy named John O'Brien. Uh, John O'Brien actually uh, committed suicide back in the 90s, um, right after this book was picked up from being made into a movie deal that starred Nicolas Cage. Uh, it's an okay book, movie, but it's, it's an excellent book, and it really deals. John O'Brien wrote four different books, and they all really deal with the idea of alcoholism and alcohol dependence. So again, if you want to know, have more information from a writer that knows the material very well, um, I'd recommend you pick up one of these books as uh, for a leisure activity. Here we see the difference between alcoholism and the sporadic drinker and the chronic drinker. I pay a lot of attention uh, to this table. I think it's an important one. It shows the difference between what happens with a chronic drinker and with a sporadic drinker because alcohol impacts them differently. Uh, even in the uh, you know homework for this chapter, there's a, there's a nice video that, that, that you know, I assigned you that shows the difference between the sporadic and the chronic drinker and what happens as they drink. The CAGE system is very useful to somebody to identify alcohol abuse. Um, the CAGE stands for different letters. C, have you ever felt you ought to cut down on your drinking? Have people annoyed you by criticizing your drinking? Have you ever felt bad or guilty about your drinking? And have you ever had a drink first thing in the morning to steady your nerves or to get rid of a hangover, such as an eye opener? Uh, positive responses to any of these can suggest an alcohol problem. It doesn't mean there is one, but it's time to maybe talk, you know, start talking to people, say, what have you seen? Or, you know, talk to a physician or a counselor or somebody, you know, because we do want to help people with these sort of problems. Uh, that's that's what professionals are here to do. Um, so, again, you know, it's always important if anything's going on to reach out um, for yourself or for a loved one. The treatment is uh, different depending upon what it is. One of the big things is... Uh, especially with alcoholism, 
Uh, a lot of times uh, you can't take somebody directly off of alcohol, uh, you know, cold turkey like you can do with cigarettes if somebody wanted to do that. Um, instead, you have to slowly walk the person down because there's a condition called delirium tremens, sometimes called skeleton syndrome. Uh, you can look it up and, and see what that's all about. But again, they have to slowly walk the person down because it can actually lead to uh, cardiovascular involvement and shock and, and lots of uh, really rough things for the patient. These are the general guidelines, and this is a big thing to take away as far as, you know, these are the dietary guidelines, moderation, 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 uh, no more than one drink a day for females and older adults, people over the age of 60, no more than two drinks a day for men. Um, don't worry about the, uh, you know, benefits associated with it. Um, really be more concerned about the risks. Drink meals socially. That's the key. Drinking alone is not a good idea. Don't drink while pregnant and don't drink and drive. And non-drinkers should not start drinking for health reasons. Again, the risks outweigh the benefits. So that's really it for this module as far as alcohol uh, use. There are two reflections I want to do associated with alcohol. One is on the craft movement and just on the industrial beer movement. So uh, there's going to be a little space for a reflection essay, just about two paragraphs. Uh, pick a beer or an alcohol that you thought would be potentially a craft product based on its name. I'll, I'll give you a couple of names again. Um, Stellar Artois, uh, Blue Moon, Rolling Rock, all these are fine ones. But then through online searches, find out if that's actually the case. It's probably owned by a company. It could be AB InBev, it could be Miller, or it could even be Coors. Um, and then reflect on what this means to the current industry and how to do a better job, not just with craft beer or craft alcohol, but how as a consumer in general to find out what different products are made by independent, uh, you know, companies or not. Um, just to give you an example, is again, you know, Cascadian Farms. It's a big company that makes organic uh, cereals, but Cascadian Farms is also owned by a, a very large company called General Mills. So again, you know, a lot of these products on the market that you're going to find, um, another one, Kashi or Kashi, uh, they're owned by Kellogg's. So a lot of products on the market are being marketed in a way to the consumer to look like they're made by small companies, but in reality, they're owned by a very large corporation. So after the uh, reflection, I do it, want you to do a discussion as well. And so this will be done as a group, um, alcoholism and driving after imbibing. So in this case, you're going to imagine you have a friend, Mark. He attends a party on a Friday night. During the party that starts at 9 p.m., Mark drinks 10 beers. The time is now midnight, so three hours has passed. So what I want you to do is tell me, is it okay for Mark to drive? And what would you base that on? What could be the implications if he does? And imagine, uh, besides this one scenario here, imagine you notice Mark is drinking a lot lately. Lately, He's drinking four beers or so every single night, um, sometimes by himself, sometimes he has a drink in the morning just to wake up. Um, what would this mean to you for your friend? And what could you do to help your friend out? Um, is there anything you could do or say or, or talk to somebody? And again, you know, from this idea again, please make sure to start at least one new comment or thread and respond to two others uh, so we'll get a lot of feedback. All right, folks, thanks a lot for your time. I hope uh, you have a good, uh, 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 an okay time with this activity and, uh, you know, talk to you soon.